would like to today to uh, travel a bit, invite you to travel a bit back in time with me. So let us travel uh, four and a half years back. Um, and then let's ha have a look at that person here. Because that's me four and a half years ago. Do you know that moment when you are starting an exciting new project? When you have that empty white piece of paper in front of you, you're starting an exciting new adventure. And you feel like you want to do nothing less but changing the world. But at the same time, you feel a bit confused. You feel a bit lost in that jungle of opportunities. I was exactly in that position four and a half years ago when I started to work for you, Heinrich. So what are we doing? We are providing solutions for all areas of interlogistics. So from a typical forklift truck to a completely highly automated interlogistics solution. Uh, more than 70,000 people worldwide work for you, Heinrich, and we are producing more than 120,000 forklift trucks every year. And <clears throat> at Jung Heinrich, we believe that connecting machines has the power to change the world. We believe that connecting machines will change the way we do business. It will change the way that we are going to perform all these little tasks that we carry out on a day-to-day -day basis. And we believe it will, of course, also change the way we are doing internal logistics. So why do we believe that? So let us look at a simple example. So what happens typically if one of our customers has a problem with one of our forklift trucks? So in that case, typically he's calling us. And sometimes we don't get much more information than the truck doesn't work. So in that case, we send one of our service technicians to our customer. And what is the first thing that he's typically doing? Well, the first thing that he's typically doing, he's connecting his laptop when he's actually locally at the truck directly to the truck. He reads out log information, and based on that information, he can often determine what the problem is and fix it. But sometimes he realizes there's a problem with one specific part of the truck, but he doesn't have the white spare part with him to fix the problem. Or he realizes that, well, it's not really a big problem. I just need to change the configuration of the truck. Um, so I think, at least in the interconnected uh, future that I'm dreaming of, that's not really efficient, is it? So if we connect machines, um, I think then no one should ever be able, uh, should ever has to go to the customer side in order to read all these log information. No one should ever needs to go to the customer to determine what the problem with one of our trucks is or to change the configuration of a truck. Um, so that's a very simple example that can give you an idea of how we can use uh, connecting machines in order to significantly improve the productivity and cost efficiency of a warehouse. So four and a half years ago, I was extremely excited because I started a new project and my job was to connect machines. My job was to build something what many people today call an Internet of Things platform. And I was super excited, but after a while I also realized in order to successfully finish that project, I had to deal with a couple of major challenges. And I still remember the first moment when I experienced one of the major challenges. So my job was to connect machines, and I knew in order to successfully do that, I need to deeply integrate into those machines. And, and in order to do that, of course, I have to talk to the people that are responsible for building, producing our machines. And I was super excited, so I went to one of our production sites and started to talk about that cool new project and how many you know, opportunities it will offer. And of course, we want to do remote software updates and we want to be able to more iteratively deploy software onto our machines. I was super excited, but I, I realized during my presentation that I continued to look in the same faces with the same uh, critical, skeptical um, look in, the, in these faces. And um, then they started to ask questions like, oh, you want to do remote software updates? But how can you ensure that if something went wrong, that that is not going to have a negative impact on the normal operations of our trucks? Oh, you want to push, deploy software more rapidly onto our machine, but how can you ensure that that software is going to run nice and smoothly on all these kind, different kind of trucks with all these different kind of configurations? So they were asking quite reasonable questions, but I realized at that time they weren't as excited about their product as I was, and they saw it rather a threat to the correct operations of the machines they, feel resp they felt responsible for, still feel responsible for. Um, so 
when I was back in my office, I realized, oh man, I have that's one big challenge. And I realized in order to be successfully able to connect machines, the first thing they need to do is connect people. Um, and I think that that's one of the interesting relationships because now that we are connecting machines, that we are connecting cloud services to machines, of course, those people that are coming from the world of cloud services, of web applications, now have to talk to the people that are coming from the world of building and producing machines. And they have a different culture. They have a different way of working. They use different tools. Um, so that's a big challenge. But um, at that time, there was a, a second major challenge that I would like to share with you today. I'm a computer scientist, and my job was to, was to build a Innocence platform. Therefore, of course, I started to think about how can I do that from a technical perspective? What tools are available on the market? What are the right basic building blocks in order to do that? And I remember at that time, everybody started to talk about the Internet of Things. And I remember almost every day, one of those aggressive sales guys called me and said, hey, listen, Dominic, I have like the perfect IoT solution for you. Just connect your machines, it will solve all your problems. And I was a bit surprised because how can you, how can you have the perfect solution? Even I don't, I just start to understand my problem, how can you have the perfect solution? And if I, when I started to dive a bit deeper, I realized that they are trying to sell me often the same solution that they're selling for years, sometimes for decades, and now we're just labeling it as IoT for marketing purposes. But I was still a bit confused and felt a bit lost in you know, that jungle of IoT solutions and w was looking for some kind of orientation. So I started thinking about what actually is the Internet of Things. And I think it's really hard to have the one and only perfect definition, and I'm not going to try to provide you one today, but what I would like to share with you today is my perspective on the Internet of Things, in this case, the perspective of a computer scientist. So how do I look on the Internet of Things? Um, so I guess probably you are not very surprised if I tell you, well, the Internet of Things is about connecting things to the Internet. <laughs> but, but what actually is, what do we mean if we say thing? Well, I think a thing can be almost everything. It can be a coffee machine, it can be a car, it can be a forklift truck, but it can also be a server in a data center. It can be a smartphone or a laptop. Um, I think typically people are not, if they, if they say the end of things, they typically don't have something like a laptop in mind because those kind of machines, those kind of things are already connected to the internet for quite a while already. Um, but now I'm a computer scientist, right? I'm a nerd, so what do I see if I look, look at the laptop? What I see looks a bit more like this. So for me, a laptop is just, it's just a housing, right? And inside of that housing, there's a computer, and it has input and output. So input can be the keyboard, it can be the mouse, output could be the display or the speakers. And of course, because it's connected to the internet, one of the input and output is the internet, so I can receive messages from and send messages to the internet. But the interesting question is now, what do I see if I look at a forklift? So, I mean, it's obviously a very different thing than a laptop, and what is the key difference from a computer scientist's perspective? And the answer is surprisingly simple. There's no difference. There is no principal difference. And maybe that might look like it's a um, simple finding for you, but for me, that was very powerful. Because based on that finding, I understood that the Internet of Things, from a computer science perspective, is neither something new nor in an interesting concept at all. <laughs> and I realized, and that was extremely helpful for me to give me orientation, I can simply ignore the IoT label. So it doesn't really matter if, if there's the IoT label on a product, on a solution, um, in order to understand whether it's useful for what I intended to build. So then I realized I'm just having, I'm just responsible for a really exciting, complex software and hardware project, but the term IoT is not hel helpful at all for me. Um, so that finding was helpful for me in order to um, yeah, get a better understanding and get some orientation. Um, and based on that finding, I was able to come up with a quite reasonable architecture and, and an idea of how to implement it. But still, um, there was a second challenge I tried to point at the beginning of the talk. And frankly speaking, that was the much harder part, right? Connecting machines, at least from my experience, is much easier than connecting people. And the question is, um, we had the problem, and 
um, that we didn't have as much as support from the people that are responsible for building and designing our mach mach machines as, as required. And what do you typically do if, if people aren't supporting you in a classical organization? You start to complain about it. You try to put pressure on them. You try to escalate. You try to point out how important your project is, and you ha they have to support you. And of course, we tried that as well. But frankly speaking, it doesn't really work out pretty good. And I think that's also not the kind of collaboration that we um, believe is is going to lead you to a successful um, way of working. And, but when we started to um, more, have more and more contact points with them, we also started a bit better to understand, started to understand their world. And we realized that connecting machines has also the power to change, to improve their world. Because what do they typically do? Well, if, our, if my colleagues, if they are developing a new forklift truck, so that's a quite a complex, big project, and before they actually sell that to our customers, what they do is they have a field testing phase. So they, that means they give the trucks to real customers in order to get feedback and to better understand um, how is the user experience from the customer's perspective, but also um, whether it works from a technical perspective in a real-world scenario. And in order to have a better understanding of that, um, what, what do you have to do if your truck is not connected, but you want to monitor it. That means you always have to drive to the customer side, correct your, uh, connect your laptop, and read out the log information in order to get an understanding of how good your, your newly developed truck works in a real-world environment. And that's really time intensive and annoying. And as we understood that, we realized, okay, if we would give a tool to our colleagues so that they can read out that information remotely, that would save them a lot of time and money. But at that time, there was already a lot of pressure on the project, and that actually wasn't in the scope of our project. So I, for quite a long time, tried to avoid building something for them. And, but when, the, when, the, when it continues to be a huge problem for us, that lack of support from them, I changed my mind after a while, and then we decided to build that tool. And I still remember the first moment when we actually delivered that tool to them. And I saw that the expression and the faces started to change. And it was so cool to see how they started to love their tool. And it was so cool to see that one of the most skeptical guys from our production lines actually started to be our biggest supporters and fans, just because we delivered them that simple tool. And yeah, that was, that was extremely helpful for us. And based on that tool, um, we, based on that tool, we could dramatically improve our collaboration. And at the end of that story, um, we managed to successfully deploy and, and um, finish that project. Uh, it's live since the beginning of that year. It's working quite nice and smoothly. And we had a big go live party together with all our colleagues from the production lines. And um, that was like one really good way to enable them to have that intrinsic motivation to really also want that project to be successful uh, as we want. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>